Hi, welcome to week two, chapter six, deviance and social control, the flip side of deviance. Um, first of all, the most important thing for you to understand is that deviance in sociology is a specialized term. It's not like deviance the way you use it in ordinary conversation. Deviance in ordinary conversation, you know, oh, that person's deviant. It means, you know, they're a pervert or whatever. Um, it doesn't mean that in sociology. In sociology, the specialized meaning, and this is very important to keep in mind for the test, is that deviance is anything, any behavior, any symbol, uh, anything that is different from the norm. So it's not necessarily deviance can be good or bad. An astronaut is deviant. Why? Because, well, it's not the norm in society for everybody to be an astronaut. So that's deviant from the norm. Um, to be a murderer is also deviant because most people in society are not murderers. That's not our so cultural social values. And so both an astronaut and a murderer are deviant in the sociological sense in that they are not the norm. They're not what most people are doing. And so deviance is different from stigma. Deviance is simply being different. Stigma is a negative meaning attached to the deviance. Not necessarily to all deviance, but to the kinds of deviance that we see as negative. So deviance can be a positive thing. Deviant, I mean, being top of your class, that's deviant. You have the highest GPA at the college, that's deviant. You're way above the norm. Um, and that's good, <laughs> but it's still deviant, according to sociology. Um, and uh, negative stigma, we typically attach to deviance, which is socially unacceptable, unacceptable to our values. Um, it used to be, I'm going to use tattoos as, as an example. Um, when, I, when I was growing up and when my mother was growing up, the only people who had tattoos had a negative deviant stigma. Um, now there were, there was one group that was allowed to have tattoos that was members of the military. That wasn't looked down on. But motorcycle gangs, criminals, people who were perpetually in prison, um, those were the only people that had tattoos and women did not get tattoos. You know, maybe if they were a prostitute. Um, tattoos were heavily negatively stigmatized um, until the 1990s. That's when it changed. Until the 1990s, um, they were heavily stigmatized. So deviance can change over time. What is deviant today might not be deviant for your kids or, you know, two years from now. Deviance can change over time. So some of the things that we think are not deviant now, previous generations believed were very deviant. I, I mean, a parent would have had a complete heart attack if their child got a tattoo and they were part of the normal middle class family. I mean, that would be a huge crisis. Today, it's not so much of a crisis because it's more of the norm, meaning there are enough people in society doing it that it's considered a norm, not one that you have to follow, but one that not, you're not going to get as stigmatized for doing as before. So deviance can be positive or negative, and stigma is the negative label that we attach to things that we perceive as having low value or signifying low status. So there's deviance and stigma. Stigma is sort of the value judgment about the deviance, negative value judgment. Okay, so why do people deviate? Um, why do people do things that are different from the norm? Uh, why do people get their belly buttons pierced? That's not all, that's approaching the norm. That's getting pretty common. Um, why do people, uh, 
do things that most other people don't do. There are a lot of reasons. Um, combinations of environment and uh, any kind of genetics, mental issues for, that it could arise from either source. But sociologists tend to focus on deviance in group settings or through the institutions of the entire society. So we're not so much interested in asking an individual, you know, why did you get your belly button pierced? Um, we're more interested in asking, why are so many people as a group getting their belly buttons pierced? What's going on socially? What are the other social con conditions? What are the contexts of their everyday lives that are making this more common? So you see the difference between individualistic thinking and sociological thinking. Okay. So sociological theories to explain deviance. Uh, we'll start with symbolic interactionism. And symbolic interactionism has uh, three different theories. One is an explanation called differential association theory. Differential association theory states that you become deviant and the typical examples are given for negative stigma deviance um, and it's particularly used in criminal justice to explain why people become gang members um, or members of criminal gangs uh, or organizations. Differential association theory basically says birds of a feather will flock together. If you hang out with people in a gang, you have a higher chance of becoming a member of a gang than someone who doesn't, who has no exposure, because through repeated interactions, you will come to accept their values as your own. And so when you're accepting their values as your own, you're more likely to become a full-fledged member. So that's differential association, meaning if you associate with different people from the norm, you, will, you have a greater risk of becoming deviant in whatever way they are, are deviant. This is how religious cults work, um, actually. Um, religious cults... Um, Typically, a person will get approached by a member of a religious cult and become friends with this one person. And then slowly over time, they get invited to things with um, other friends who belong to the cult. And pretty soon, their whole social activities are surrounded by the people in the cult. And they come to adopt the cult's values of their own after repeated exposure to their norms and values. And that leads them to join the cult. That's another example of differential association theory. That's typically how people, you wonder, you know, how do people end up in these cults that think, you know, very uh, odd things, uh, like a comet is going to come to the sky and take them to heaven, um, things that are a little out of the religious norm, even with our amount of religious diversity that we have. Um, it's pretty unusual to think that a UFO is going to come get you and take you to Jesus, which is what a lot of these cults do believe. So differential association also works to explain joining religious cults, to explain becoming a criminal, or to explain becoming a scientist. If you are a kid and your parents are scientists and you spend time in your social world hanging out with scientists, chances are you'll be predisposed to be interested in science because you'll have so much exposure to it. So that's differential association. Second one, control theory. Control theory says the only reason that you're not being deviant is that You've got that little voice in your head saying, no, don't do that, that's not right. And you have uh, external factors like your parents, your friends, what will they think? Society, you know, what reactions will people have if I do this? Um, so you're being controlled by society. Society sort of keeps you in line with the norms. And it's just not worth the risk to you to deviate. So that's control theory. And it refers to social control. The third one by eminent sociologist Howard S. Becker is labeling theory. 
And this has been shown to be very accurate in some really disturbing education studies. Um, labeling theory basically says that if I label you as deviant in some way and I keep repeating it to you and get other people to repeat it to you, you'll soon come to believe that that's what you are. So if you have, you know, uh, a young child who's uh, into, say a 12-year-old who's into fashion and they start dressing like a gang member because they think it's cool, well, if you start treating them and labeling them like a gang member, as the police will do, the police do profile, um, then they will be forced into positions where they have to adopt that identity. If real gang members see them on the street, they may try to interact and pull that person into the gang. And so once they're labeled as being in the gang, they come to take on that identity. They take on the label. Now, here is the classic example from education. Um, a teacher was given, this was an elementary school, an elementary school teacher was given a list of the students who would, I think this was a, a sixth grade class, who would be in the class. And on the roster, it identified each child as being gifted academically or not. Now, I'm sure the teacher didn't do this on purpose. Our subconscious assumptions are really powerful. Um, you can find yourself doing things that you had no idea that you were doing because of subconscious biases or the positions that you're put in. And so what happened was at the end of the, the school year, the students who had been randomly assigned by the researcher to have the label gifted next to their name performed better than the students without that name. Now remember, there was absolutely no difference. All of these students had the same IQ. The researcher just put a label next to their name, just labeled them as gifted, and they became gifted. The ones who were not labeled as gifted just sort of floated through. And so that's a very scary thing to think about happening on a large scale. Words, words are very, very powerful. And one thing that sociology shows you is when you add up the effects of individual words, they make a real difference in people's lives and the society that they live in. So that's labeling theory. When you are labeled, you come to accept the label or if other people are treating you according to the label that they think you should have, you're going to react to that and fulfill that label. It's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, people tell you something is true, so you make it true. And so this is also used to explain deviance. But you see, deviance isn't always bad. In this case, our deviance was high academic achievement. Okay. The next one we have is from functionalist theory. You want to look at page 164 of your text. There's a chart there that says strain theory. And actually, I'm going to look at it now with you and go through it because I think it bears some explaining. Okay, top of 164, that little chart. And what you want to look at across the top, it says mode of adaptation, cultural goals, institutionalized means. What this means is cultural goals, that means that there is a socially accepted goal that is approved for you to go for, like owning your own home, um, driving a nice car, um, getting a vacation, you know, things like that. Those are socially acceptable goals for you to work towards. And then there are institutionalized means. That's the column next to it. Institutionalized means, those are the ways that society provides you to get those things legitimately. 
you know, by, you know, getting a good job, working hard, saving your money. Those are all institutionalized or socially approved ways of doing this, you know, become an NBA star, you know, make a lot of money, become a famous actor, um, or just, you know, have an, a more normal occupation and save your money. These are acceptable. Start your own business, whatever. Okay. Now, conformity, you'll notice on the chart, conformity is someone that accepts that the goals are good. Yeah, it's good to have a nice house and a nice neighborhood. Yeah, it's nice to have a nice car. Yeah, it's nice to take a vacation. And yeah, I don't mind working hard for that. So that's conformity. Now, what is underneath that are four different types of deviance. So he's really looking at deviance even more deeply and breaking it down into subtypes. And he comes up with four. So if you look on the chart, it says in bold, deviant paths. The first one is innovation. Now remember, he's thinking like a sociologist. These terms are specialized. Um, it's not exactly how you would use it in everyday conversation. Innovation. This is someone who accepts the goal, the cultural, socially approved goal, like, I, like they want the nice house. I'll just use that example. But they reject the socially approved means of getting it. So maybe they rob people to get their money. Um, maybe they do illegal activities um, to get the money to do that. Maybe they join organized crime to get it. So they accept the society's goal of having the nice house, but they reject society's accepted way of getting it. And so that type of deviance under strain theory is called innovation. They're innovating a new way to get the money outside of what society allows. The second one is ritualism. In ritualism, you have a person who doesn't really care about the goals. They're just doing what they know that they're supposed to do. So they, in terms of having the nice house, they don't care. They just don't care. But they do go to work every day because that's just what you do. And this is not conformity. This is deviance. You're going against society's, what society wants you to want, which is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting uh, comment on our consumer culture, <laughs> that if you go against consuming, you're deviant. Um, the third one is retreatism, meaning that you retreat. You, this is someone who throws up both hands and says, I don't care. I don't want the house and I don't want to work. And they're going to be either uh, homeless or maybe they're going to go in the woods or out in the desert and build a shack and live off the grid, live off the land. Um, but the, it's called retreatism because they've retreated. They've really retreated from everything. So they reject society's goals and they reject society's way of getting them. They say, I'm going to live differently. I really don't care about these things. That's retreatism. They're retreating from society and its norms. The last one is rebellion, which in some books they go ahead and make it explicit that this is um, associated with counterculture, meaning against the culture. A counterculture is a culture that has values that are opposite or completely different from the host culture. From the 60s, it would be the hippies. Um, for uh, violent motorcycle, criminal, criminal motorcycle gangs is an example. So they re can either reject or replace the goals. Like the hippies wanted a different uh, world that didn't depend on consumerism and was more natural, they really just rejected the mainstream society's goals of making money and getting the house and whatever. At the time, instead of having a house, hippies often lived in communes where people shared the work and the raising of the kids and the cooking, and they just thought that was a better way to live. So they replaced the, the goal with something else that society really just didn't recognize. Um, they're rebelling against it. And they do the same thing with the means. Um, instead of going to work all day, um, they could replace that with barter. 
so it's a, replacing the system with something completely different. This is a rebellion against the system. Um, and often it's, it's uh, associated with counterculture. Okay, so make sure you take a look at that chart and that you really understand the differences between them because that can really trip you up on a test um, when you see this list of deviants in front of you and you're not sure what's what. Okay, so to recap, deviants is something that is different from the norm, can be positive or negative. When it's negative, it carries stigma, which is a negative valuation, negative social valuation. In symbolic interaction theory, we have three explanations of deviance. One is differential association theory. Two is control theory or social control theory. And the third one is labeling theory by Becker. Now the chart that we were looking at um, is associated actually with strain theory. So I guess we actually have four there. Some people consider strain theory part of functionalism, some part of symbolic interactionism, so that one's a little, I won't ask you about that, but I will want you to know what strain theory is. Okay, now we have um, functionalism, and strain theory fits here too. In fact, you know what, let's just, I'll make an executive decision. I'm putting strain theory under functionalism. <laughs> there we go. Um, strain theory is going under the functionalist title. Okay. Um, so see page 164 for the, for the different paths. And then there's another part of functionalism. So let's put strain theory under functionalism. And then here's a question, that, and, you, and you can leave a comment about this question, and we can go back and forth about it. Remember functionalism? You know, there's manifest functions, latent functions, dysfunctions. Think about homelessness. And here's my question for you to make a comment on on this video on YouTube. Um, make a comment that... And you have to be signed in to do that. So sign in. Make an account. It's free. Sign in. Um, and at least use your first name so I, and an initial so I know who you are. What latent function might homelessness serve to keep the economy running? What latent function might homelessness serve to keep the economy running smoothly, to keep people working. So think about that and leave a comment. That's another functionalist take. Some functionalists say, you know, deviance can be functional. This is kind of a, a controversy, but not not with a big C. It's a controversy with a little C. Um, but can functionalism, can deviance be functional? And a lot of theorists think yes. Okay. Our next theory of deviance is conflict theory. Remember, this is the one about social classes, follow the dollar, which social class benefits, which social class loses. Your reading in theory should make all of this easier for you. Um, so what do you think that a conflict theorist is going to say about deviance? Um, they're going to start looking at social classes, and here's what they're going to say. They're going to say, okay, well, a really basic form of deviance is crime. Who makes the laws? It's, it's the ruling class. The ruling class makes the laws. We don't get to tell the judge what to do. Um, the ruling class makes the laws. And so whatever they define as deviant or criminal is going to be deviant or criminal. Not because that thing is in and of itself deviant, but because the ruling class has decided that it is deviant. So that's a conflict theory perspective. Conflict theory is always interested in power, who has it, who doesn't, and specifically in terms of which social class has it and which social class doesn't and how they are affected by it.
So the argument goes that the ruling class created the criminal justice system. We, we didn't. It was in place. When you were born, there was one in place. It was created a long time ago by ruling elites, and that's the. therefore it's going to reflect their values, their beliefs, and their ideas of what is deviant or, you know, which crime is worse than another. Um, and so that's a basic conflict theory perspective on deviance. Okay, here is, I want to talk about a specific case of deviance, and that is crime. I'm going to talk a little bit about crime, um, crime statistics, how they're compiled, and the two basic types of crime. There is street crime, you know, stealing cars, uh, manslaughter, murder, rape, robbery, burglary, um, these kinds of crimes. And street crimes are reported in the FBI's Uniform Crime Reports, which are often abbreviated as UCR. Um, and so we do have statistics on those crimes. Now, the other kind of crime, called white-collar crime, or crime in the suites, we don't have really good statistics on it because it's not in the FBI Uniform Crime Report. It's hard to find these crimes because the people doing them are rich and powerful. They can protect themselves with lawyers, with bodyguards, um, big, big shredding machines. Um, and so crime in the suites, the white collar crime, is actually more expensive to the American public than the street crime is. Um, it costs about five hundred billion with a B a year, and it it does it like this. If you remember back to Enron, um, and if you can find it on Netflix or YouTube or Hulu, Hulu or whatever you use, there's a great film called Enron: The Smartest Guys in the Room, and you will be amazed at how blatantly unethical they are in their pursuit of profit and how incredibly illegal the things that they did were. They had the biggest bankruptcy in U.S. history when they went bankrupt. But their bankruptcy, because of the way they had done things, bankrupted a lot of regular working and middle-class Americans because they had been playing with pension funds, stocks, and investments. So when their company became worthless, you have, uh, for example, in the film, there's a guy that works for a Portland, Oregon power company, you know, been working 30 years, ready to retire, and he's been saving for 30 years, and all of it's gone, zero, goose egg. And he has no way to get it back, none. So we, these connections are often hidden from us. Another example is oil spills that are caused by things like... Um, improper implementation of safety uh, protocols. Um, that can harm, people can lose their homes, they can lose their way of making a living, the environment can become completely contaminated for generations with this waste. But the companies are seldom uh, made to clean, completely clean this up Part of the reason for that is it can't be made completely clean. They don't talk about that a lot. When you see energy companies talking about how they're working to clean up the environment, um, a lot of what they spill can't be cleaned um, for generations. And so the true cost of their white-collar crime in ignoring the safety regulations um, and making sure that their equipment is up to par costs generations. Not just the people whose houses get flooded with oil, not just the wildlife that get caught in it. Um, generations of people, land has been, land or water has been made completely useless. Um, and when they go to court, what you see in the news, the news will say something like, you know, this oil company was just fined this many billion dollars for this oil spill. So the public feels good. Okay, they did something about it. They have to clean it up. We feel good. Here's what we don't see. In the next following months, the oil company goes back to court 
the press isn't there, and they ask for an elimination or a reduction of their fine. They automatically appeal. This we don't see on the news, and this is why we have a problem. Okay, so that's crime in the streets versus crime in the suites. Crime in the suites, or white-collar crime, includes in investment banking fraud, um, any kind of fraud, um, anything where someone is using corporate means to do their crime. You know, they, they wear a suit. And my favorite example of this is when, you know, is that show Cops still on? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? There's a, there was a show called Cops, and they always see the cops, you know, are chasing down the criminals. But in all the years of watching Cops, I have never seen them chasing a white guy in a suit and a tie. Never. Despite the fact that that kind of crime done by that demographic costs us $500 billion a year. Way more than street crime costs us. So, just an interesting observation. White collar crime, usually um, they get fined. The executives might get fined. The company might get fined. Typically, no one goes to jail. Enron was very unusual in that they prosecuted the top three. Uh, one of them committed suicide. Uh, one of them died of a heart attack. And I believe there's one left in jail. But out of that whole company, they just picked three to make an example of when the whole company was doing it. And so there tends not to be jail time. What would a conflict theorist say about that? That's another thing you can put in the, in the um, comments. Okay, so to wrap up Chapter 6, um, one of the last things that I wanted to talk about is the medicalization of deviants. And Thomas Saz um, talks about this. And an example of the medicalization of deviants is when you take a behavior that's outside the norm and attribute it to a medical or psychiatric condition. And a good example of this is ADHD, which, um, uh, attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Some people just call it hyperactivity. Um, but a lot of the things that are diagnosed as ADHD in school children today were normal when I was a kid. That was just a kid with a lot of energy. That was just a kid with uh, rambunctious. That's what kids do. But the norms of what society expects kids to do have changed into we want kids to be more controlled. We want them to be more corporate somehow to, so that they fit into their corporate job when they get there. And if they're too fidgety, we don't see it as them just being a kid. We see it as a disorder. That's what the medicalization of deviance is. Some kids are just more rambunctious than other kids. Now, I do want to emphasize that this disorder does exist. My little brother had it. Um, it. It does exist. It's real. But it's extreme. And what's happening now is that normal childhood rambunctiousness is getting diagnosed the same. We have an overdiagnosis of ADHD. Um, if you've seen it, and it's it, maybe if you're a parent and you've had a child who is truly ADHD, if you've seen it, you know there's a difference between a kid with a lot of energy who's always running around and a kid who truly has hyperactivity. Um, you can see the difference. So that's the medicalization of deviance. We medicalize all kinds of things. That's for another chapter. Okay. So, um, thanks for watching the video lecture. Be sure to um, comment with any questions. Comment here. Comment on the discussion boards. Um, it's better than sending me email because everybody can benefit from your question. Chances are, if you have a question, 10 other people have it too. So you might as well ask. Um, and feel free to post video responses if that's fun for you. If it's a chore, don't do it. Just use the discussion boards. And I'll see you next week.